and I'd like to welcome um, Peter Howell. So Peter's here. So Peter has been the Professor of uh, Applied Mathematics at Oxford since uh, 2014. Uh, I believe he first met Anthony when he did his master's degree on uh, the thinning of a liquid layer over a probe in a, in a multi-phase flow. They had many fruitful discussions together. The industrial application was a device to measure the rate and volume fractions of a three-phase flows in undulating pipes. He went on to uh, uh, to study extensional thin flows, a topic close to some of Anthony's significant scientific contributions. Today's Peter's talk will be to us about the stretching of fibers, sheets, and tubes. So Peter, with that, I hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, just like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak today. Um, I, I'm really, it's really a great honor for me. Um, so I've been asked to talk about a stretching of liquid fibers, sheets and tubes. Um, and it goes without saying this is an area where Anthony has made uh, huge contributions uh, over the years, which I'm going to talk about a bit. Um, and let me just say a bit more about my, uh, uh, my background. So yeah, my um, doctorate was in, was basically about uh, mathematical modeling of uh, fluid flows in the glass industry. Um, so a lot of stretching of fiber sheets and tubes. Um, and uh, I guess on and off over the years uh, with various co-workers, um, I've been working on similar areas. Uh, so again, some of that's gonna come up later as well. Um, and the story about my, the master's thesis on probes, it's not quite right, but I'm gonna come back to that later as well. Oh, there we go. Uh, so this is the, what I promised to talk about, uh, fibers, sheets and tubes. And, and actually, when I started preparing this talk, I quickly realized that there was no way I was going to be able to talk about all of these things. So I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to skip talking about sheets. Uh, so apologies to anyone who was really desperate to hear about uh, stretching of sheets. Um, so uh, the first thing uh, I'm going to start with is talking about fiber drawdown. And the, really the foundational document uh, on this subject is this paper uh, by Anthony back in 1969. Uh, and here's a picture from that paper. Uh, so the, the setup is you're, you're um, pouring molten polymer uh, through this spinneret through a hole here. And so you're then extruding uh, a fiber of uh, viscous fluid. And basically you're, you're sort of pulling at this end and it's that tension that you apply uh, when you're pulling the fiber that causes it to stretch out. Okay. Um, so the, the game here uh, is basically we want to use the uh, the slenderness of the geometry uh, to simplify the, uh, the governing equations, the Navier-Stokes equations and all the um, boundary conditions. And when you do that, uh, the couple of things that come out, um, first is that the, the, the flow is extensional, um, by which I mean that the velocity is basically uniform uh, on, in any cross section of the fiber. Um, and then um, you get a constitutive relation uh, between the tension in the fiber um, and the, the rate of extension. And, and notice I'm, I'm sticking to Newtonian uh, fluids. Uh, so glass is uh, very close to being Newtonian, uh, molten glass. Um, uh, though obviously when you're talking about polymers, there's important non-Newtonian effects. Uh, and I think we're gonna be hearing a bit more about uh, non-Newtonian fluid dynamics uh, later today. Um, but anyway, so this is the constitutive relation you get, uh, and it involves, this is the, the sort of uh, viscous contribution. So mu is a viscosity, A is a cross-sectional area of the fiber, and this is sort of the rate of extension of the fiber. And there's a contribution from surface tension as well. So it's surface tension, uh, and then C is the circumference of the um, cross-section. Um, so, uh, so provided you've got a circular fiber, an axisymmetric geometry, well then you can easily relate the uh, circumference to the cross-sectional area. Um, but I'm going to talk a bit later about what happens when the uh, circumference isn't axisymmetric. Uh, so you need some other way of closing the problem. Um, so look, here's the basic governing uh, equations. Uh, I've got conservation of mass here. Um, and then the, um, I just label all of these bits. This is the momentum equation. Uh, so I've got a contribution from inertia. It's the Reynolds number uh, there. This is gravity and that's the Stokes number, the relevant dimensions parameter there. And this is that tension term that I just wrote down on the previous slide. 
Um, and now I've got a dimensionless parameter for the service tension, which is basically an inverse capillary number. Um, so in molten glass, uh, the viscosity is uh, typically a very strong function of the temperature. Uh, so really what I ought to be doing is looking at the energy equation as well. But for the moment, I'm gonna try and keep things as simple as possible, neglect thermal effects, inertia, gravity surface tape to just do the simplest version of the problem. Um, so this is what you end up with. Uh, the, the only physics that's left in the problem now is um, viscosity, really. Um, and you end up with these two coupled partial differential equations for the cross-section area of the fibre and the, and the velocity. And for drawdown, um, this is a typical setup. Uh, so at, at the top, I say I'm going to, I know what the size of the fibre is and I know the speed at which I'm injecting it. And then I also specify the speed at which I'm pulling at the bottom. And, and the input, there's only one dimensionless parameter left in the problem now. That's this, uh, the ratio between the speed I'm pulling at the bottom and the injection speed. That's called the draw ratio. And um, that's going to be bigger than one. Um, and typically, actually, it's, it could be a lot bigger than one. Um, um, and in the steady state, it turns out you can actually integrate these equations quite easily. And you just get that the velocity and the area are both exponential functions of the distance uh, along the fiber. OK, so that looks uh, straightforward. Uh, now, oh, yeah, John Ockenden asked me to mention this. Um, so John and some co-workers um, showed that actually this nonlinear system of PDEs, uh, you can linearize, you can transform it into a um, uh, basically a linear hyperbolic PDE, a bit like the telegraph equation. And then they um, subsequently discovered that actually Anthony had already uh, made this uh, discovery and you can find it in his book on polymer processing and um, uh, this is kind of a theme I think of this talk that um, uh, that uh, when you're you're working on something as you move forward you always tend to find that Anthony has got there before you it's a bit like being Scott of the Antarctic um, so um, the drawdown process is, is, is a continuous process. It, it operates in steady state. Uh, so really um, what you care about then is, is the steady state stable or not? Um, and again, this was really um, tackled theoretically for the first time uh, by Anthony and uh, Matovich. Um, and what they showed is that the steady state loses stability if you go above a critical value of the draw ratio. And uh, what you see is there's a hot bifurcation and you get this oscillatory sort of varicose uh, instability. It's known as draw resonance um, in the industry. Um, and all I'm showing here is that actually this is, it's a really nice calculation. This I I started setting it as a, an exercise uh, for um, grad students. It's one of the, the few exercises like this where you can actually solve the eigenvalue problem uh, sort of semi-analytically. Um, so yeah, so that's, uh, uh, draw resonance and uh, draw resonance is it was well known to practitioners uh, but what they also knew was that in practice uh, they seem to be able to draw at much higher draw ratios uh, than the theory would suggest they ought to be able to uh, and again this was um, explained uh, by Anthony back in 1972 um, and really the culprit seems to be the reason that the theory was not agreeing with experimental observations. The main culprit seems to be that temperature effects ought to be included. And here, what this is showing, uh, this vertical axis is the square root of the draw ratio. And the horizontal axis is, is basically a, a normalized heat transfer coefficient. Um, so what you see is as you increase the importance of thermal effects, the critical draw ratio increases dramatically. Um, and actually, the, the, the picture, if you continue this picture, it, it gets um, even more um, puzzling, at least puzzling to me. Uh, this is a picture from our student Deeran's uh, thesis. Uh, but I should say that actually the same behavior was um, also observed for a slightly different system uh, by Benoit Scheid and um, Howard and co-workers. Um, uh, so what you see is that, um, this, again, this horizontal axis is basically uh, heat transfer coefficient. So as you increase that heat transfer coefficient, the critical draw ratio first increases dramatically um, by many orders of magnitude and then decreases again. And, and I had to say there are 
various explanations of this, uh, or sort of physics, physical explanations of why you get this very dramatic increase and decrease. Uh, but I personally still find it pretty puzzling. Oh, and I'm not going to don't want to spend too much time on this, except to show, again, that um, maybe surprisingly, draw resonance is still an issue. So this is a piece of work we did quite recently uh, with shot glass, and they're still interested in um, in a drawdown process. How does the system respond to um, these sort of vibrations that you inevitably get in a real industrial setting? Um, so this response, this analytic uh, formula for the response here, you could find in Anthony's paper, 1969, and we did a, you know, slightly generalize the problem, but you could see really our response diagrams are almost really the same as uh, what Anatony had already done um, over 50 years ago uh, now. Oh, so uh, this is the pro problem that was talked about before. Um, and actually, um, the story here is, um, uh, this was Jim Oliver's master's thesis, and I was a supervisor for it. Um, uh, and Anthony, it's fair to say we had um, many, many uh, discussions with and um, really extremely insightful. And it, uh, yeah, it made a big impact on Jim and on, on me. Um, I was actually trying to find um, an example where Anthony and I had worked together. And this was the only example I could find. Uh, but I did vividly recall um, the experience of what Herbert was talking about earlier of uh, being subject to Anthony's questioning lack of clarity or logic in all talks. I certainly uh, was on the receding end of some of that myself as a graduate student and a young researcher. Um, so I'm going to go on and talk about uh, what happens if you've got a fiber that's not axisymmetric, uh, the cross section is not circular. Um, here's just some examples. So in reality, this is an optical fiber coupler. These are pictures of what they call microstructured optical fibers. Uh, where you have a um, very complicated cross-section and, and really multiply connected. Um, so the question is, how can you close the problem uh, for, to work out what's happening as you draw the fiber when you don't, the, the um, cross-section isn't axisymmetric and actually working out how the cross-section evolves is an important part of the problem. Um, so um, these are the same governing equations that I wrote down before. I'm, I'm taking isothermal for now. Um, just to simplify things. So I, my problem is I've got two equations for three unknowns because I've got the velocity, cross-section area, and the circumference. Uh, so how am I going to relate the circumference to the area when it's not a circle? Right. Uh, and so I've got to figure out how the shape of the cross-section evolves. Right. Um, so uh, you could come at this in sort of various steps. Um, here's I've, this is just a schematic. Um, so I've got some you know, bizarrely shaped uh, fiber here that I'm drawing. And the first thing you do uh, is you scale the coordinates, the so y and z in the cross section, with the square root of the area. So now with respect to these scale coordinates, the shape is evolving, but the area is constant. So the area is just one everywhere along uh, this fiber. Now that's step one. Okay. Step two, so now what I've got to do and this is this sort of three-lobed uh, shape. So suppose I start with that three-lobed shape, and I just solve a two-dimensional time-dependent Stokes flow problem, okay, with air equals one and surface tension equals one, right? And that's what I'm showing schematically here. So as time evolves, uh, this funny sort of three-lobed shape is evolving towards a circle, all right? Now you can solve that problem, whatever your favorite method is, numerical or semi-analytical, whatever your favorite method is for solving 2D Stokes flow problems. Okay. So having done that, then um, we can then calculate what the circumference of this normalized problem is. I'm going to call that C hat of T. So we could, we'll calculate how that evolves with time. Um, and that is related to the actual circumference because of the normalization is the actual circumference divided by the square root of the cross-section area. All right. Now I can close the problem. So I go back to my governing equations. I plug in that the circumference is the square root of the area times this function c hat that I just worked out. Um, but I have to evaluate this c hat at the reduced time, which itself satisfies this uh, sort of hyperbolic PDE. And um, we can 
think about this physically, what's going on here is, so this inverse capillary number is basically proportional to the surface tension, and I've got the square root of the area on the bottom. So the tension increases, or the area gets smaller, then the cross-section evolves more rapidly, and that's kind of what we'd expect to happen. Um, so, like I say, to solve the Stokes flow problem, you pick your own favourite method. Um, and um, I, and well, I, I'll share an example with Linda Cummings, made some progress uh, by using these complex variable methods uh, that are developed by Hopper and Stan Richardson um, and other authors. So the idea is, here's my funny shaped cross section. I'm going to try and view that as the image of the unit disk under a time dependent conformal map. This F is um, a time dependent conformal map. And then basically, if I work out what F is, I know what the cross section is doing as a function of time. And uh, so Linda, like I say, was important. She's an expert in this stuff. And there's now a whole industry in um, figuring out different classes of conformal maps for which this works. Um, here's an example um, where you can do this. I don't want to go through all the details except to say that um, the whole evo cross-section evolution problem in this case boils down to a single ODE. So this determines this parameter B as a function of T, K is a uh, complete elliptic integral. Um, so you solve that ODE and then once you've, you've solved that ODE you can then feed that into here and it tells you that C hat of T is which is the thing we know to close the problem. And here's a picture. Uh, so here we started with a sort of four-lobed um, shape and we gave it some sort of waves in the axial direction as well to see what would happen. Um, and you stretch it out. Um, and what you see is, well, it, it, it uh, evolves to this shape here. And um, so really the evolution of the cross section and the stretching in the axial direction are coupled to each other. And in particular, you could see that if I look at one of the thin bits, it's become almost circular. Whereas if I look at one of the fat bits, it's still quite sort of bulgy. And that's a manifestation of what I said before about this uh, reduced time, that the, the rate at which the cross-section evolves depends on how big the cross-section is. Yeah, and I, I just want to make the point that um, since um, uh, we started doing this, other authors have sort of run, really run with this idea and taken it a lot further than, than we ever did. Um, and here's an example from a paper by Yvonne Stokes and um, Darren Crowdy and uh, co-workers. So again, using much more complicated and, and very clever um, conformal maps, they can describe multiply connected cross sections. So I've got four disks or close to disks that are touching initially, and we can see how those then fuse together if you stretch out the resulting fiber. Okay, so that was all about fibers. And um, next I'm gonna talk about tubes. Um, and um, this is, again, a problem that really uh, came from uh, shot glass. And um, they wanted to be able to draw uh, glass tubes that had a square cross section. And then they were gonna make them into bottles and vials and things like that. Um, so the question is, if I want to draw out a glass tube that's square at the bottom, uh, what, what shape should the die be at the top uh, for, to make that happen? Um, so, um, our, this is a paper I was involved with, um, again, a long time ago, uh, which was about really, um, yeah, glass tubes, really glowing glass tubes to make bottles and things like that. This was yet another example where Anthony uh, was, was way ahead of us, and, um, and I actually I saw that Chris is at the meeting as well. Um, so, uh, this paper of 1970, this is to do with um, film blowing, so, uh, um, and I believe it's to make... Uh, uh, sort of plastic films to make plastic bags and things like that. Um, so again, I've got a thin viscous uh, tube here um, that you're blowing with air on the inside. Um, so yeah, so like I say, that was sort of way ahead of what we tried to do uh, many years later. Um, so um, I want to now make this geometry non-axisymmetric. Okay? Um, so that's going to make life harder. Uh, but what's going to make life easier is I'm going to take it to be slowly varying in the axial direction. Um, so what we've really got then is something that looks like a fiber, except it's a fiber whose cross section happens to be hollow um, and uh, have a thin wall. Um, oh yeah, so this is work with Ian Griffiths 
I should say, going from several years ago now. And so this is what the cross section might look like, right? So this is the, the glass here. And really it looks like a, a kind of a thread, a viscous, a 2D thread, a viscous liquid um, that forms a closed loop. And I'm going to denote the thickness by H and the length of this thread by L. And this theta is the angle that it makes with the sort of horizontal. Um, and um, I'm using this uh, variable psi here as a spatial variable. And um, the problem with this is that because the length's varying, um, the arc length, the domain of the arc length is varying with time. And so it's actually convenient to scale the arc length with the length so that then psi always lives in the fixed unit interval. Uh, so if I can solve this problem, then the circumference, the thing I need uh, to close my uh, problem for the drawing of this tube, um, is just twice the length, okay, because I get once for the outside and once for the inside. Okay, so, so actually if I can solve this evolution problem, then I've closed the problem for the drawing of this tube. Um, now actually, um, I've drawn a case here where the thickness is varying uh, spatially. Um, if I take the thickness to be uniform initially, then actually it stays uniform for all time. And all that happens is uh, then the thickness increases linearly with time and the length then decreases in inverse proportion. And that's the effect of surface tension. Remember, I've set the surface tension to be one um, here. Um, so what surface tension is doing is it's making this thread retract and as it retracts, it gets thicker. <clears throat> Um, so now that you get this very um, interesting PDE uh, for the angle theta, this theta determines the evolution of the shape of the cross section. Um, it's a second order in space, apparently, uh, but you've also got these two unknown functions of time. Um, so actually you need four boundary conditions uh, to close this problem. And, and all these boundary conditions really say is that um, as I go from sort of one end of the fiber to the other, the whole thing forms a closed loop and it joins up uh, smooth, the two ends join up smoothly. Um, so that's all that these uh, boundary conditions really say. And actually, um, if the geometry is symmetric, uh, so if it's got any sort of reflectional or rotational symmetry, uh, then you can prove that these two functions A and B have to be identically zero. And then actually you can integrate this whole equation analytically. Um, so the, now we know precisely how the shape of the, the, the cross section of the tube evolves um, just in terms of what its initial shape is. Uh, and one thing we could see from here is that as t tends to infinity, if I drop this term, the whole thing is approaching a circle. So theta being just proportional size, just producing a circle. And that's what we would expect. So as time increases, um, whatever I start with, it's going to approach a circle. Um, so, uh, so here's an example. Uh, here's, this is the example of a, a square initial shape. So I just slightly smoothed the corners, okay? And as T increases, it evolves towards a, a circle as we would expect. Um, uh, and what this, sh the other thing that we demonstrated here is that as you vary that smoothing of the corners, um, the solution doesn't vary significantly. And that really shows that the, um, that we can approach a sensible limiting solution if we uh, let the smoothing go to zero and actually we have an honest to goodness corner there. Uh, now one uh, really surprising but, but um, yeah kind of interesting thing about this model is it's well posed for decreasing time as well. Um, so here's an example. Again we start off with this square um, shape here. We run time backwards and this is telling us now what shape would I need to start with so that I produce uh, a square sometime later. Um, so that inverse problem you can actually solve and yet solve it explicitly. Um, um, so uh, again, this is work with Ian. Um, I, I don't want to dwell on all the details except to say that, as I said before, once we've worked out how this um, circumference function is evolving, uh, then we can close the problem for how the variations happen in, along the tube and we can solve the whole problem, uh, in this case, analytically. Uh, so again, I'm just going to show some examples um, here before I run out of time. Uh, so uh, here's an example where, we, again, we want to produce a square tube at the bottom and this shows what shape we need to start with at the top to make that happen. Uh, so we start with this 
um, shape here. And then as we go along the tube, we get this retraction that I was talking about. So the whole thing shrinks down and gets thicker. We end up with a nice square tube at the bottom. And so that's a nice thermal example. And we did look at including temperature effects as well. So here's an example, we're feeding in hot glass at the top and it's cooling as you go down. And the main difference is that all the action happens near the top where the glass is hot and still viscous. And, and most of the evolution has already happened uh, fact, but by the time you go between the first two uh, values of x that we looked at. Um, yeah, so I think I ought to wrap up. Um, so I, I don't really have any grand conclusions here, um, uh, uh, apart from to say this, that I hope I've demonstrated several instances uh, of what John Ockenden called the Pearson effect. Uh, and this is what happens when you come up with an idea um, that you think is really rather clever and then you discover that um, Anthony already thought of it uh, many years previously. Um, so I've had that experience uh, many, many times uh, in my career. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure that many other uh, people listening have had that experience as well. Um, okay, that's me done. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much, Peter. That's uh, been uh, very uh, interesting and uh, lots of ideas to also think about. Thank you, Peter, for expanding and stretching our understanding of these uh, complex uh, flows. And I look forward to more stretching in the future.